we got just another one last session tonight. Right after the session, they're going to open downstairs. It uh, looks like we're going to baptize four individuals or uh, maybe five. I'm not sure yet. Uh, everybody's welcome to come down and celebrate and praise the Lord. They open it exclusively just for us. We've done that every year. So um, one, of the, one of the dear ones that got saved last year had not yet gotten baptized. So she's here to get baptized tonight. And so we're excited. And, and uh, it is. It's, it's, it's part of the joy. And so um, we want you to make no sh that you know about that. Also, tomorrow morning, if you want to come in 15 minutes early, a quarter till nine tomorrow morning, LA is going to be leading some worship time, and we're going to go into more than 12 seconds of prayer. Okay? <laughs> we're going we're, we're gonna, to we're gonna unleash some uh, intercession and prayer and warfare prayer, and we're going to. So if you want to be in that, and you want to rage a little bit in the spirit of God, and uh, you know, pray and uh, do some stuff against the enemy. Uh, be here a quarter till, and then from there we'll go into my session. And if God just comes with great power, I'll be glad for Him to take over my session. Amen. It'll be better than my session. Okay, Amen. Father, we just thank you right now. I thank you for everyone here, and Lord, we just want to just simply offer up a prayer over this, and just thank you for anybody in consideration in this area. And uh, we ask you again to bless Douglas as he comes back here to lead in this last session tonight. In Jesus' name, everybody says. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> for this next session, if you forgive me, I have, I think I, most of you know I have an artificial leg. I had cancer when I was 15, and frankly, due to the Lord's work in my life and the prayers of a lot of my family and friends, uh, I'm here today. So I'm going to kind of sit down. That's okay. <laughs> Praise be to God, because I guarantee you I had less than a 10% chance to live back in 1969 when that happened. So um, I like to think that there's a reason for me being here. I tell my kids there's a reason for me being here as far as you're concerned. So it's that generational thing. It works that way. We're going to talk about, I think, a very difficult, a very troubling subject. Um, it's a series of subjects, but it really boils down to sort of the, this term called mind control. We've talked a lot about DNA, and of course, that's really the, the theme of the conference. Uh, but as several of the speakers have alluded to, there is a kind of mind-body-spirit-body body connection. And we see this in many different ways. And it turns out this talk will discuss how the Germans, how the Nazis, not Germans, but the German Nazis, were involved in some specific mind science that I believe has affected not only our intelligence operations in the United States, but it's conceivable that it has affected the Christian church. And uh, I will talk a bit about that. I won't be able to cover all the issues, but uh, in the, uh, the book, that, again, uh, it goes into great detail about this. And uh, so if it is a, an area you wish to look at more, I will encourage you to, uh, to study that. All right, so we're going to talk about the Manchurian candidate. We're going to talk about social engineering. We're going to talk about how this has really affected uh, liberty in our country. So we're going to talk about why did the federal government allow the German Nazis into the U.S. after World War II, and how did they influence our various sciences, um, technologies, social science, intelligence, military industrial complex. They affected it in all of these ways. The, the notion of mind control, it's a very hot topic, and it has been for a long time. I'm not going tonight to talk about, uh, and you're not going to see, you know, subliminal presentation on the screen where it flashes like a desert picture, and then real quick it flashes a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi or whatever, you know, that, uh, remember Mr. Subliminal, for those of you that have watched Saturday Night Live? Yeah, so we're not going to go into those things. We're going to talk about things that are well documented, well understood, but again, it's information that you're not likely to have heard much about. It's a dark subject, it's a controversial subject, despite the fact that it's well documented. Um, and I'll talk more about how I know some of the things that I know in terms of my own sort of research into this. But there have been, of course, a lot of books written by various folks, both secular and Christian, uh, on this. But in America in particular, this is not a subject 
that uh, is well understood. I happen to believe it's because there is a veil over America on this subject. I happen to believe it's because the government wants it that way and has been working towards that for at least the last 50 years. Uh, the Nazi contributions to America, we've talked a little bit about the relationship of eugenics and, and uh, genetics and how the two interplayed between Germany and America. Uh, rocket technology, uh, Project Paperclip I'll, Paperclip I'll talk more about, but of course our uh, most famous rocket scientists, Werner von Braun, um, uh, Hermann Ulbereth, um, and Arthur, let's see, Arthur Theodore, I believe, was the other one, uh, father of the Atlas rocket. Computer technology, very involved in that. Uh, lasers, laser technology. Joseph Farrell argues that the Nazis did have an atomic bomb. They didn't have a means to deliver it, but they had one and that they were not using centrifuges, they were using laser technology that they had already developed in the 1930s to actually use it as a means to create fissionable material. And of course, the favorite, flying saucers, anti-gravity. And again, I talk a bit about that in the book. Uh, the theory that I have, and I think even L.A., who's really the expert on this, agrees that it's probably the UFOs may not just be demonic deception. It could, in fact, be technology that may have been developed initially by Germany, uh, may have been sort of moved into the Soviet Union or into the United States. That's actually how I opened the book, talk about the 1952 Washington Flap. You hear a lot about Roswell, but you don't hear about so much the, the Washington Flap in July over two consecutive weekends in which uh, UFOs were legion over Washington, D.C. They were chased by Air Force jets the largest single press conference occurred right after that. Don't hear about it anymore though, do you? No. We'll talk a bit about remote viewing. We'll talk about social science, psychological programming. All right, we asked, the gentleman asked the question about the financing of the Nazis. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt called them the robber barons, the Treaty of Versailles, the financiers of the world, the world bankers, essentially saddled on top of, uh, of Germany at the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, huge debt repar reparations for World War I. This really led to the instability in Europe and ultimately, it's argued, led to, uh, to the German uh, resistance and in effect revolt against those uh, reparations. And at the core of that was the Union Bank Corporation. Uh, Fritz Thyssen was a German involved in that. As you see the article there. Uh, but so was George Herbert Walker, the father of Barbara Bush and Prescott Bush, the father of uh, George H.W. Bush, Bush the Elder. Uh, they were involved in the Union Banking Corporation. It was event in eventually uh, the, the assets of the Union Banking Corporation were confiscated in the early 1940s during the war. Why? Because they were financing the Nazis. All right, a future president would come from the Bush family. Now, I'm a Republican, so it's not like I'm a Democrat, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter where you're talking about Republicans or Democrats. Mm -hmm. Essentially, there is a, in effect, elite fascist uh, sort of backbone of this country, and it has been influential in running what happens in America. Uh, as I talked about, Amer oh, you may not know this, but the American, co American corporations were building, the Union Bank Corporation was financing a massive uh, industrial park in Poland. They had railroads coming into it. They had barges coming into it from one of the, the rivers there. It was Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. Hitler turned around and turned the industrial park into the single biggest death camp, Auschwitz. American corporations built it. They financed it and built it. I talked about Ford, GM, IBM. Uh, Ford and GM have actually apologized for their role in the Holocaust and in their role in um, the support of the Nazis. It's interesting, IBM has never officially apologized for its role in the Holocaust, yet it was right at the center of the Holocaust. Well documented in the book by Edwin Black, The, Nux, the Nazi Nexus. 
All right, and so he said, with IBM as partner, the Hitler regime was able to substantially automate and accelerate all six phases of the 12-year Holocaust. Identification, exclusion, confiscation, ghettoization, deportation, even extermination. For IBM, Hitler's Reich represented an immense source of profit. Beginning in 1933, the Reich became IBM's single largest overseas customer. The plan for Nazi immigration, we talked a bit about the rat lines. In August of 1944, there was a meeting amongst the six top German industries and in, uh, corporations, including Mischer Schmidt, Volkswagen, IG Farben. IG Farben, in fact, was the center of the Nazi military industrial complex. You know how long it took to unwind IG Farben and all of its stocks that they had, they created this giant cartel. They brought in stocks from all these various countries overseas. It was not fully unwound until 2003. It took over 50, <laughs> over 50 years, almost 58 years to unwind it. All right, why? Because there was a lot of American money in that. So we're not gonna, gonna lose that money. We're not gonna lose that stock. We're gonna figure out a way to get it out. But anyway, there was a planning session and Martin Bormann, who was Hitler's, by this time he had become Hitler's second in command. He was the chairman of the party. He was the financial genius. Most say that in the last year of the war, Bar Bormann was really running uh, the Nazi party, not Hitler. Uh, I talked about Grey Wolf earlier. But Bormann uh, called this meeting of the German industrialists. He basically said, the war is lost. The, the Allies have just landed. They're, you know, they're going to beat us in France. They're going to march across Europe. We have to have a different plan. So our different plan is we're going to infiltrate the capitalists uh, in the West, in Europe, in America, in South America. We're going to move our monies, literally you know, billion, a billion dollars or more in money that was moved from German banks through Swiss banks into Argentina banks, into American banks, as we talked about, I just showed that article uh, about uh, Fritz Thyssen and his money in American banks. Uh, this, was, uh, this was the plan for the Fourth Reich, and this plan was implemented. A guy, an English correspondent in 1944 wrote that the Nazis are already planning for the next war. They are already moving monies out of Germany into the nations of the West to finance the Nazi party and what will become the Fourth Reich. Great story, don't have time to talk about it, but it's very possible that the Nazis found the Templar treasure that was poten uh, potentially, and the history seems pretty good, I've read in several accounts, that it was stored in southern France in what's known as the Languedoc region, uh, the Cathars, which were the enemies of the Catholics. There's this whole interesting conspiracy theory about the Catholic Church, the Templars, the Cathars. Don't have time to talk about it, but fascinating story. I do talk a bit about it in the books. The rat lines, we've talked about the Catholic Church, the Perones in Argentina. Um, massive plan to move the Nazis out of Germany and into the West. The New York Times, this is well documented. I cite a number of articles. A lot of them broke in like 1995. Um, but like even here, I talk about the New York Times in the 1950s, that Nazism is not dead in Germany. Given the time and opportunity, a form of Nazism could again rise to power. Materially speaking, Nazism was smashed into a pulp by 1945, but the vigorous roots remain. John Loftus uh, worked in the Department of, uh, in the Department of Justice. Uh, he wrote a book called The Belarus Secret that was part of a 60 Minutes program that Chris, not Chris Wallace, Mike Wallace, his father, actually won a Pulitzer Prize on, telling the story of how many Jews were killed in Belarusia and White Russia. Here are the White Russians, the Belarusians. Um, Loftus talks about that. But as they often say, it's not the crime, it's the cover-up. The government, American government, was instrumental, not just the Department of Justice, but the Department of State. The military and the intelligence services all conspired to bring the Nazis into America. There were laws that were passed to limit how many Nazis came in, but uh, the military and the intelligence services figured out ways around these laws. Um, Loftus talks about it in the Belarus secret. Um, and by the way, he has newly declassified documents in his 1912 version, many that the government would not allow him to 
published. They were government documents, but based upon like the 30-year rule or the whatever that rule was, and um, um, Freedom of Information Act, Loftus was able to publish many of these things. For instance, Churchill and Roosevelt had an agreement. They would each use the other's intelligence service to assassinate business people in their respective countries that were supporting the Nazis. It's good in government documents. So in effect, Roosevelt hired James Bond to assassinate certain American businessmen in New York that were too pro-Nazi. American CIA, or in effect OSS, because that's what they were known as before in the war, were involved in assassinating British people that were too favorable or too friendly with the Nazis. Um, so the, the USA knew of the, of the Holocaust. Roosevelt got re weekly reports. He knew of it. He knew it was happening. The Jews were expendable. I talked about the assassination. Uh, the New York Times was set up as a channel for disinformation. Uh, for the CIA, I talk about a lot of quotes, how they were supporting, uh, saying things to support the communist revolt and revolution, uh, how, you know, the communists were good people, there's no, there's no uh, starvation going on in Russia, that's not true. The New York Times published all sorts of reports providing the American public with disinformation about what was happening uh, with socialism, all right? Oh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood was, uh, was involved and was started um, uh, it's supported by Hitler, uh, started in the 1930s, uh, very involved in, in fact, the uh, Mufti of Jerusalem met with Adolf Hitler. Uh, so there was a, a significant conspiracy between uh, certain Muslim parties, very fascist. And of course, we continue to see that even today. It, uh, it lives on. Um, I, don't, I don't think I have a slide here, but it talk, I talk a bit about how um, Israel was uh, actually not uh, a country that America or the British obviously wanted to have happen. The petrodollars were with the Arabs. And that's what they wanted. That's who they wanted to survive. So the Jews had to fight against America and the English both. Talked about the Catholic Church and the rat lines. Alan Dulles, Dulles International Airport, Washington, D.C. Been there many times. Uh, there's a bust of Dulles in the lobby. I've gone up and stared at it kind of with an evil eye. Uh, <laughs> At the end of the war, 22 intelligence groups were rolled into the CIA, uh, the head of office policy coordination. Henry Kissinger, how many of you have seen Dr. Strangelove? Who is Dr. Strangelove? Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger in the 1950s, his job working for Alan Dulles was to plan World War III. His job was to play, he was, a, he was an avid anti-communist. And of course, remember, Dr. Strangelove was talking about launching a nuclear war, that that's what we should do to defeat the Russians. Um, so, a lot more detail there. Again, there's Werner von Braun, that's his team of 104, I think it was, rocket scientists from Pinamunde, which was the German rocket science, the secret rocket science lab in northern Germany on the Baltic Sea. And, uh, Von Braun bought his whole team over. There's a whole story I go into about Von Braun. I talk about the space, the, uh, the, what's called the secret space program. I talk a bit about that, rely upon the research of a lot of other folks. Sometimes I just compile things and try to make it readable because it's very difficult sometimes to extract this information. But the, uh, the concept of what was really going on uh, with NASA, the conspiracy and the fight between the Masons that were very much involved in NASA versus the Germans. That's a, that's a big story. The paperclip, Operation Paperclip, comes from the dossiers of the German scientists. There was a limitation to supposedly a law of 100 that was passed. Truman would allow 100 Nazis to come in. The military figured out ways around it. They created this thing called Operation Paperclip, where they uh, invented dossiers saying that this person was not a Nazi or this person was not dangerous, even though they might have been instrumental in, uh, in death camps uh, in World War II. Now I'm going to zero in on the mind control issues. And the argument that I build is that the Nazis were involved in mind control in the 1930s and in the 1940s. And in fact, the mastermind behind much of the mind control and what we will call multiple personality disorder or disassociative identity disorder 
uh, Joseph Mengele was very likely involved in actually architecting how this science would work. Uh, there's, of course, a tremendous amount of research that's been done, many, many books. I've read too many books on Nazi and the occult. Ugh, it's dark stuff. But at the end of the war, there was a group of Nazis. Uh, it was a program called Dr. Greenbaum, German for tree. And it was the tree of the Kabbalah. And a uh, strong argument that the concept of the Jewish Kabbalah, this mystical religion, was involved in Nazi ideology. But specifically, the Nazis were experimenting with what we've come to call remote viewing, clairvoyance, using it as a means of intelligence gathering, being able to see clairvoyantly, which clairvoyance means clear vision, uh, be able to see what was happening. And, uh, and of course, uh, there were things going on in, in, Brit in Britain, not so much in America. We're too scientifically minded. We were not really into the occult at that time. All right, but there, these projects eventually, Project Artichoke, uh, Bluebird, MK, MK Ultra, were fed, I believe, by a lot of the original work that was done by the Nazis uh, during the war. And as we'll talk, eventually this worked its way into remote viewing. And I'll tell, talk a bit more about that uh, as we go. Remote viewing in the US, in, uh, US intelligence, uh, the two American physicists, Hal Putoff and uh, Putoff and Russian uh, Russell Targ, very involved at the Stanford Research in Institute, uh, military intelligence that was done at the at SRI. This became a big issue at the end of the 1960s. The Woodstock, the hippies uh, protesting, worried about how Stanford had gotten too involved in the military-industrial complex. But what was going on was again this looking at remote viewing as a means of using extrasensory perception, ESP, as a way of gathering intelligence. Uh, a gentleman named Ingo Swan was sort of the father of RV. RV was a very specialized, I call it sort of clairvoyance or mediumship in lab coats. Yeah, there's a lab coat on earlier. But the, the, uh, it was a very uh, scientific setting in which the remote viewers would be set uh, in a chair and they would be, you know, sort of like, almost like elevator music played in the background, but very quiet, meditative and uh, they would be given information where they would go off and they would find based upon coordinates where certain information was if they were trying to find an American general that had been kidnapped that happened in one of the instances um, many many situations associated with remote viewing I'll talk a bit more about that uh, but it was a technique that was developed uh, in depth uh, by the American military in the 1970s uh, Derek, you and I've talked a bit about this on your radio program. Minutes, Derek Goats. Who was the uh, who was the uh, the uh, guy that uh, General Albert B. Stubblebind? Yeah, that, well, General Stubblebind, also known as Moon as Spoonbender. Yes, because he was very uh, intrigued by uh, um, uh, Uri Geller. Yeah, yeah and, and bending spoons. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, the Men Who Stare at Goats, that movie was, was based upon some of this early work that was done in the military in the 60s, but eventually blossomed in the 70s into, uh, in the defense and military intelligence uh, in an actual program involving probably about a half dozen individuals. I talk in detail about the remote viewing. I also talk a bit about remote viewing as a means of space exploration, which is being done and has been done now for oh, the past 25, 30 years. So uh, we're actually, we have been looking at Mars. We've had remote viewers inspecting Mars for some time. And it, it all plays into the hype surrounding whether there's intelligence on Mars or has been intelligence. And uh, that's the subject of a future book I hope to have published this, this summer. So these are the cast of players, the key people in the MK Ultra project. Uh, Dr. Sidney Gottlieb ran the project. Uh, Dr. Colin Ross has written a series of books. There were something like 149 projects, sub-projects in MK, uh, MK Ultra. MK Ultra ran for at least 10 years, probably more like 18 years, in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, LSD testing, uh, I think I talk a bit more about the LSD testing, but they, uh, Gottlieb was probably the first person to use LSD, LSD to kill someone. Um, he did do that, and eventually his family was awarded $750,000 uh, in, the, in the 1995 Clinton hearings, which I'll talk a bit about. Um, Dr. Jollyon West, Jolly West, he was a particularly evil guy. Uh, a couple of these guys turned out to be from uh, Oklahoma or in Oklahoma. 
Uh, Jolly West, one of his claims to fame, not really, but he actually killed a pachyderm at the Oklahoma City Zoo, uh, giving it an overdose of LSD. Um, he was a chief scientist. He was involved in interviews of Timothy McVeigh. <coughs> he talked uh, against remote viewing, but he actually was running, uh, in part, the remote viewing program. He actually used the remote viewers to hunt down uh, the individuals that were involved in the Patty Hearst Symbionese Liberation Army, that whole story. You may recall Patty Hearst, those of you that are older. Younger folks don't know about this, but this was uh, a very famous uh, rich heiress that was kidnapped and brainwashed and uh, was involved in a robbery of a, of a series of banks, if I'm not mistaken. Dr. Ewan Cameron, very well documented. Again, a particularly evil man, used electroshock therapy as a means of, of analyzing individuals and uh, had this particularly nasty way of characterizing a personality. He called it patterning. And the, the way that you would uh, cure someone with psychosis was you would de-pattern them. And by de-patterning them, he would give them so many electric shocks and send them to convulsions that it would completely destroy their personality. So they would become zombies. You see a little bit of that in the movie The Changeling. If you've seen uh, Angelina Jolie, that character, she goes into the hospital. Uh, that was a little bit sort of the precursor of that. Um, the stories about Cameron are legion. I talk a bit about them in the book, but it's very well documented. Uh, he, like all the others, were paid for by the CIA. Uh, academics, there were probably over, I think, 80 academic institutions that were paid uh, to do studies. One of the authors says something like 100 PhDs could have been done with the money that was funneled into these programs to study uh, how to do, in effect, mind control and manipulating the human, the human mind. Um, Dr. John Gittinger, fascinating guy, created the Gittinger Personality Assessment Test, the PAS, um, has still been used. What they really used the personality <laughs> assessment test for was to identify individuals in the Army or in the military, in the, in the Congress, that they could blackmail. They do it by testing to see whether or not this individual was likely to be a pedophile. And so that's how they identified a number of the people that they could then, as we'll talk about, take children from and put them into this program, their children. But before we get there, let's talk about a broader type of mind control. Uh, even in the 1920s, Walter Lippmann, very, uh, very intelligent person, talking just about how public opinion should be shaped, um, how the media could be involved in shaping public opinion, talked about the myth of the omnicompetent citizen, the idea that even the average Joe doesn't really know, Joe the plumber doesn't really know how to vote for the right people. And so you can't really trust democracy to work. So basically the media has to control and has to spoon feed us what we should believe. So Goebbels was uh, Hitler's Ministry of Pop Propaganda and Public Enlightenment. Don't you like the, just the arrogance of that? But essentially, the CIA, uh, after, in the 1960s, 1970s, would sponsor the creation of over 1,000 books, uh, purchase 50 magazines. They would spend the 1978 over $265 million in actually feeding to the American public, excuse me, reinforcing our anti-communist views. Now, we are it's okay to be anti-communist, but in effect what the government was doing was it was reminding us why we should hate the communist. And so it was using the media and exploiting the media to shape public opinion. The whole concept of brainwashing was invented, uh, in effect, by the CIA. It was invented by Alan Dulles and fed through a guy named Edwin Hunter, Edward Hunter, uh, the concept of the Manchurian candidate. Ultimately, today, we've had like 50 owners of multimedia, or of media, has been shrunk down now to five. Does that mean we're going to get more diversity or less? Much less. Much less. So, and Lippmann said, most men, after a little freedom, have preferred authority. Sounds like Dick Cheney. So, the movie The Manchurian Candidate, right? Uh, this was a 1962 film remade in uh, not too long ago with Denzel Washington. But I guarantee you, look who that, that evil woman is down in the lower right-hand corner. That's Little Miss Murder, She Wrote Herself, Angela Lansbury. 
talk about a good actress, if you see the original film, Frank Sinatra's terrible. He's terrible as an actor in anything. But uh, Lawrence Harvey, I still think of him as, uh, as the guy in the Alamo, you know, Colonel Travis in the Alamo. But Angela Lansbury was a particularly evil woman that was involved, and she had her son, of course, turned into a Manchurian candidate, the Queen of Diamonds, when he would see that. That was his trigger that would cause him then to implement whatever he was told to do. Pick up the phone, listen to the phone, the phone would tell him what to go do. All right, so this was the concept of the Manchurian candidate scared the American public to death. Uh, it was talked about uh, you know, by his novel. Eventually, a book by John Marks, uh, The Search for the Manchurian Candidate, uh, was written in the 1970s and talked about Richard Helms, who was Nixon's head of the CIA, and how he shredded all of the evidence associated with the kinds of programs, what MK Ultra was doing and so forth. The way that we found out and the way that, uh, that Marks was able to break the story was accounting records that were kept in the White House. They thought they had shredded everything, but they hadn't. And so they were able to build back from the accounting records the information. And then like uh, John Loftus was able eventually to go much further than uh, John Marks in terms of what had happened was the reason the CIA, much of the CIA didn't even know about some of the things that the CIA had done is they destroyed the indexes. So they had the data, but they had no way to find it. And so what happened is that Loftus, Loftus began to go investigate in these records departments out in different places around the country and began to pull together this information. So uh, there was a speech that Alan Dulles did talking about the evil communists. Again, communists are evil, I'm not saying they're not, but this was, this was the program. In effect, what was happening is that the Nazis were being brought into America because of our fear of the communist. We were so frightened of what the communists would do and of their mind control techniques that we implemented our own. And it turned out that while they were doing some things, what we invented were far more evil than what they had done in our fear. All right? They decided hypnotism was too unreliable. And so what they happened upon was a technique that has really been studied and known about for a couple hundred years. Uh, it's called dissociative identity disorder, DID. All right? And uh, it's also known as multiple personality disorder. Some very popular movies, Sybil, Three Faces of Eve, right? These were movies that were uh, done that talked about MPD. It turns out MPD is far, far more than we knew back from these movies. These movies gave very simplistic understandings of what was involved in multiple personality disorder. Uh, it's also linked, as those of you that know Russ, uh, it's also linked often with satanic ritual abuse. And it turns out that that is a particular form of trauma or torture that's used to disassociate a person. Now, what is dissociation? Well, dissociation, in a real simple term, we all dissociate. It's a coping mechanism. You know, we're driving down the highway, we turn on our radio, listen to some tunes, you know, and we kind of, kind of, we kind of sort of mentally doze off and we're sort of thinking about things because you can kind of drive and kind of not pay all that much attention. Well, that's an effect dissociation. It's just a very simple form of dissociation. But dissociation, the extreme form, is a form that helps us deal with trauma. And so what it's believed that Joseph Mengele did, working in conjunction with a British scientist named John Bowlby, is that they perfected techniques to use dissociation as a means of mind control. And this was actually implemented, I believe, and I'll talk about, by Mengele in the United States. All right, so this is not schizophrenia. That's the common misconception. Schizophrenia is a chemical illness. Dissociation is a psychological condition, not necessarily an illness, but it is an extreme way to cope with extreme situations. Personalities are also known as alters. They're created to cope with a traumatic situation. Switching is, in effect, moving from one personality to another personality. And again, what I want you to, I'm going to put this back in context. Think in terms of the things we've heard about DNA and the fact that there's a physiological basis to spirituality and that what was actually going on, to some extent, and I'll talk more about it, is that this form of mind control was beginning to be used to influence the minds, the psychological, uh, the psyches, the spirit, the soul, was being used as a way of controlling minds to carry out particular programs for military intelligence and for the CIA. All right? So there is a concept of a, ho a core or host personality, typically, that sort of is the quarterback for the other personalities. MK Ultra introduced a highly, highly structured program 
for splitting personalities. And this is where I, I really don't like to talk too much about it because there are kids in the room and this is really scary stuff. But systematically, it's, the, it's been well documented that the American government took children using Gettinger's personality test and they put them into this program. And it's, there's a lot of books that have been written on this. In fact, if one studies it, it's not just, uh, in fact, it's typically not Christian counselors. Russ and about six others that I've talked with, and I've talked with probably eight or ten victims uh, in doing research for the book. This is something that's talked about by dozens, dozens, if not maybe a hundred or more counselors around the country, and has been um, a pretty well-known science really for the last 20, 25 years. So a number of books that I've read that talk about dissociative identity disorder, how does it happen, what, why is it there, and it's agreed by most of the counselors that satanic ritual abuse is a real phenomenon, that it does occur, it occurs a lot. We're not talking about dozens of cases, we're talking about hundreds or thousands of cases. And as Russ would say, and I don't think he would mind me saying, it's not just a first generation, but many times the programming that's carried out is for parents to use the programs to actually uh, control their offspring and using satanic rituals to manipulate down to the next generation and beyond that. That's why the numbers can be enormous that have been affected by this technique. Um, this one scholar says that perhaps one to 10% of the US population is diagnosable as DID, that the coping mechanism is too extreme. A lot of folks do not know that they have been influenced by some type of abuse. There are many people in the United States, the numbers, I hate to speculate, but it's probably thousands. Russ uses the term millions. I may not be quite that bold, but it is far more extensive than we know. And it has been carried out in part by the US government, initially as a response to the fear of communism, but in part, it's been to set up Manchurian candidates that would be put to sleep in effect they're in the public, they don't know that they're there, and they start having problems. They start going to counselors. Lots of Christian uh, counselors deal with a demonic problem, but it's not just a demonic problem. It's a structured program that was developed to actually influence the mind. So it goes deeper. So the counselors that do this work, they will sometimes do demonic, you know, they'll deal with demonic possession, but that's not the extent of it. It goes far deeper than that. And there are some folks that do very, very specialized counseling and uh, go into generational abuse, and uh, it, it could, in fact, even be involved, and I think it is involved, in the Antichrist's plan uh, in terms of how he is influencing the public, perhaps America, perhaps the church. All right, so I talked about John Bowlby um, in the, uh, the Institute in London. Uh, many of the victims that I talked to say that the programming was done by Mengele. Their programming done in the 1950s was done by Mengele, was done by Bowlby. His concept of attachment theory, the need to be loved. Um, again, there's a lot of social science that's been written that talks about this. So this is, this is not just a theory of a couple of people. As I said, I've talked to six different Christian counselors that deal with this. I've talked to multiple victims, I've listened to multiple more do interviews and talk about their deliverance and how they've been healed and overcome through a lot of therapy over many years to overcome this. One in particular, Carol Roots, how am I doing on time? I'll try to, try to continue on and get done here before too long. It looks like nobody's falling asleep on me though, so that's good. All right, so Carol Roots wrote a book called A Nation Betrayed, and it's not a difficult book to read from the standpoint of it's only 100 pages very difficult to read in terms of the stories that she tells. But again, I've been able to confirm most of what, she's, what she tells by talking to other counselors and other victims. And um, there were, in fact, this, uh, one of the things that was really fascinating to me the other day as we were driving to the conference, I was listening to some recordings from the 1995 uh, Clinton um, committee that was doing research on this kind of stuff that the CIA was doing <coughs> and testing with, from radiology, uh, ra uh, not radiology, radiation, and um, the fact that the government experimented on the American public, uh, in some cases, uh, poor blacks in the South, 
Uh, in another case, at, there's a place called uh, Hanford out in Washington in the Tri-Cities area. Uh, the government was releasing radiation into the air. There have been many Americans in the 1995 committee that actually got compensation from the government because it was doing this testing, obviously without the permission of the American public, right? But it was testing to see how radiation would affect us. And I don't know exactly how, but many of the victims of the CIA uh, mind control, the dissociative stuff, they were also victims of radiation. And I don't know if there was something connected there between the radiation that they were being given and the mind control that was going on. 1992, a landmark study was done, our presentation was given by uh, Dr. Corey Hammond. Um, you can read the whole presentation. I quote a significant chunk of it in my book talks about the level of structuring. And when you read this, you are stunned. It sounds just like a computer program. The programming that was structured in by the CIA was alpha, beta, delta, thetas, omegas, general programming, a lot of programming that was done to train young kids to entrap mafia, to be able to compromise them, to be able to address crime. It was done in part to capture uh, information uh, through military intelligence uh, in terms of, you know, uh, counter espionage and so forth. The programming that was done in these people would also include an Omega program to self-destruct. They had programs to back up the information that they knew. Uh, one of the stories that I listened to talk, told from a victim that testified before Congress was that Kissinger had his own programmed person that he would take with him to meetings. He, would, he used her created photographic memory, almost like a laptop, to be able to draw information out of this person uh, when he would go to meetings. And so uh, just phenomenal stuff. The books out there, they're difficult to read because the stories are very harsh, but it's well documented and it's in many, many different volumes. So I talked about Mingala and Mingala and the, and the twin studies. Again, most of the victims talk about Mengele, that he was involved, he was at the, the heart of this original work that was done in Auschwitz. Um, that I get mostly from talking to the victims, not in talking or not in reading research. There's some research that suggests it, but it's the victims that talk more about this. Um, and there is, there are uh, a number of interviews that have been done with the victims that are out on the internet. Um, Doug Riggs, I know you have, your site has a number of these interviews. The victims are not just in one particular counselee's group, but they're in many groups. And they all talk about the fact that Mengele was involved. There's a Dr. Green, a Dr. White. These are different individuals. Dr. Green was Wilson Green, who was part of the Edgewater, uh, excuse me, Edgewood facility in Maryland. He was Dr. Green. And then the question was Mengele really in America? It was 1992, there was a study that was done, the Office of Special Investigations, the Department of Justice, released a report about was Mengele ever in America, let alone was Mengele a contractor to the American government. The study basically says nonsense, he was not ever in America. The witnesses, and there are dozens, say very different things. We know from uh, Mengele's biography, the, the most accepted biography of Mengele, um, that was done by Gerald Posner, that there's a gap in his diary from 1949 to 1959. And it appears to be during this time frame that Mingala was in America frequently doing programming on these victims. And I've talked to, again, to probably six different victims. I talk about this in the book. Um, it's absolutely astounding information. One of these individuals was a bit older um, and was, in effect, a personal assistant to him. Her family was in Minnesota for a time, in Ohio for a time, and she goes into great depth talking about Mengele. So, and again, other sources, uh, Carol Roots talks about Mengele, talks about his involvement, Sidney Gottlieb's involvement. Uh, it just, it's absolutely amazing information, and yet it's from enough sources, from enough witnesses spread across from enough different, group, enough different groups that I think it's, uh, it's, the evidence I think is very compelling. All right. I talk a bit about the book, The CIA Shuttle Service, Brunner and von Bolschwing, that's, that was in Christopher Simpson's book, Blowback. I use that as an analogy of how Mengele might have been moved around in America. And uh, as I talk about, there, was the, there are the interviews. So I could go into a lot more depth. It's frightening information. It's scary. Um, let me just sort of say in conclusion, I believe that 
this technique has been used. I think that there is likely, have, there are likely many Christians that are in the church that were, in fact, involved in these programs. I think there is a cloak in America. I think one of the reasons why we have a difficult time dealing with this information is that we were specially targeted by the Nazis, by Satan himself. If we even talk about the giants, I, LA, I'm not going to steal your thunder, but we're going to find out that it's very likely that many of the giants that were in America, they may have come as a result of Joshua and Caleb kicking out the giants, and the ones that could escape, they escaped as far as they could go. They went to England, then they went to America. And it's possible that based upon rituals that have been done over hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, America was well prepared for what's happening today. And so, and I'd say the churches today, it's very likely that many of the churches have been infiltrated by people that don't even know that they were involved in these programs. How extensive? I do not know. But I would tell you this is an area that I believe the evidence is there for, and it's one of the main things that I attempted to contribute to in the, in the books that I've written. So I'd encourage you to read it. I encourage you to pray about it. Uh, I think that what we're up against is more than just the DNA issues, but I think we're against clearly against the DNA issues. I think we're dealing with a lot of other spiritual issues that are enormous. They're very powerful, and they should call us, cause us all to be much more conscious about our walks spiritually. I think we are in the end times. Uh, I would encourage you to think about what this information means to you, to your church, to the people around you. I don't know what all it means. Still too early in my own understanding of it. But I'm convinced that it did happen and that it is true. So with that, let me uh, answer a few questions. There's a few questions and then we'll, we'll go to a general question session. All right. Any questions about this? Most of you have kind of stunned looks in your faces. And believe me, after going through this myself and then talking with some of the witnesses and the survivors, believe me, there's, there's far more in the books that if you choose to read them, you will be astounded. So, yes, sir. Um, when Israel was established in 1948, mm -hmm. Nazi hunters were out there, out there looking yeah. for all the Nazi criminals. Right. Right. And I heard that Rockefeller told Israel that you get your you'll get your nation of Israel, but you're not going to get all the, the Nazis. Well, that's, that's, that may be true. Roosevelt may have said that. Truman may have said that. I don't know. Of course, Truman was the president in 1947, oh, 48. He was, yeah. And you're saying Rockefeller said that to the Jews? Right. Because he was to Israel? He, was he, might, he might have. I, hadn't, I have not come across that. That would not surprise me at all. Rockefeller and the Rockefellers, of course, very involved in, in the globalism issue and all that. Um, but the Nazis very involved, obviously, in that uh, as well. That's part of the story. The Masonic issues, the Rosicrucian, these are, they're all different threads. They're all part of the story. Uh, but I wanted to share these with you tonight because I felt that they were part of the, this complex theme that we're kind of weaving, talking about the DNA, the science, because this is another form of science that was, I believe, invited into America and has been affecting our country for about the last 50 or 60 years. Yes, sir, you're going to ask a question. Yeah, one of those things, along the lines of Lisa, Eichmann getting caught was him getting caught. Was Eichmann? Yeah, but yeah he court was court caught court. by the Mossad in, I believe, in yeah. Buenos Aires, yeah. and he was taken back on a, and, and he was eventually hanged on like 11 counts of, uh, of uh, the crimes that he committed, the war crimes. He um, it's a good question. I think that they were a little too arrogant in Buenos Aires in terms of they felt that they were or, uh, sort of untouchable, you know. And uh, story on, uh, real fast on Eichmann. I know uh, we were talking a little bit last night about, you know, did the Nazis ever have their tender moments? Eichmann, the last thing he did when he, he knew he was going to never see his family again, he went to where his wife and his children where he took his three-year-old son and he hit him as hard as he could on the butt. And he said, I don't want you ever going near the water again. And that was like, that's the last memory the kid has of his father, Eichmann. I mean, you know, just evil. You know, one of the real ch challenges and the tragedies, I think, of the evangelical church in our day is it denies the reality of evil. Yeah. It talks about sin as a mistake. Yeah. God is not a God of justice. He's just a God of love. And the reality is that if you deny evil, guess what? You are not going to know what you're going up against. 
because it takes spiritual power to deal with this kind of thing. Doug, a question or comment? I've done five books, and you've done the PowerQuest series, and personally, yeah. doing the investigation, yeah. were you aware of any change, any you know, spiritual opposition? Was it a challenge for you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the question, uh, if you didn't hear it, Doug was asking, when I did the, the last book and I, and I started really zeroing in on this issue of mind control, did it have any kind of uh, special impact upon kind of my spiritual, you know, challenges? Yeah, I'd say in many ways it did, certainly. I think, though, just the, just coming to a, a sense of the truthfulness of this, it took me a long time to believe that it was real. And um, I had talked, you know, uh, Doug, we had talked, and I talked to a number of, of folks. It took me a long time. It, I, had to, I had to really think about it for about a year before I really was convinced that I had enough sources that I could feel confident that it was true. So, but I, you know, I, I definitely, I felt that it's true. Yeah. So, a couple more time for a couple more questions. The gentleman over here, yes? Uh, you know, I haven't studied the whole issue of Monsanto and whether or not any of its technology was done in Germany. There's a guy named Henry Stevens that did a lot of research on Nazi technology and Nazi science. And I think there's a book called Dark Star, but he talks about all of the different things that the Nazis were working on. Very, very wide gamut of Nazi technologies that were incorporated into American technology and, you know, utilized after the war. And, of course, you, you may not realize this or know this, but the Nazis used a lot of their technology as a means to bargain with America to get a, a better place in, in America. And well before the end of the war, there's a lot of discussions about the Nazis that sort of figured out who was going to go to the Soviet Union, who was going to go to America, and that it was well planned, well thought through. Of course, most people wanted to come to America. They didn't want to go to Moscow. But uh, nevertheless, that was part of their loyalty to the Third Reich, was to go into these two other countries and attempt to co-opt them into fulfilling the destiny of the Fourth Reich. Derek. I can't remember if I asked you this last time we talked on the show or not. Yeah. But, uh, if I didn't, I should have. Given that the eugenics portion of the Nazi program came from the United States to begin with, Yeah. how far back does this go? I mean, we can't really say then that the Nazi we transferred this over when we brought the Nazis over because we sent the stuff over there. We sent ideology associated with right. the racial hygiene and all that to them. So going back now, to the 19th century, yeah. where did all this come from? Well, I think that the, the, the Nazi technologies, it's very clear that they had advanced technologies even at the end of the 19th century, even like 1895 and so forth. They were doing some amazing things. The books I've read, I don't remember all the details right now, but there were examples of certain sciences that they were perfecting even, even before the turn of the century. So it wasn't just the Nazis that through channeling or through occult means gathered all this technology. Germans are very smart. <laughs> they were figuring out these technologies and they were advanced in many areas. And uh, so I think that, that that was sort of captured. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, we knew, in fact, it was uh, Patton made the statement, you know, that we can still lose this war at the Battle of the Bulge. Right, right. Well, and it's, it's argued that Patton knew more about what it was that he was going after in terms of certain Nazi technologies and that he was going to spill the beans and that he may have been assassinated. All right, that wild jeep that went out of control that, you know, put him in the hospital. Yeah, there's a lot of theories that someone went in with a syringe and, you know, and killed him when he was in the hospital because he may have known what they were going after. They, they were going after potentially the flying saucer technology and some other things. So a lot of books, a lot of it's speculation, but, you know, as they say, where there's smoke, there's fire. So, yeah, Doug? Right. Yeah. If you believe in the social evolution, yeah, thank you. Eugenics, yes. Right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're drawing my memory. Better answer for Derek's question about how far this goes back. In America, certainly you had the Theosophical mu Movement of Madame Helena uh, Petrovna Blavatsky and Henry Still Alcott, who was her traveling companion. You had, you know, their thing going on in Manhattan in around 1885 and all that. Uh, prior to that, though, we talk about this in book one, mm -hmm. talk about all the American mysticism and spiritualism. Again, it's part of my argument in book one is that America is a sort of spiritual Babylon. 
You know, there's a lot of evangelicals and Protestants have always said the Catholic Church is Babylon, and there's no question. There's a lot of influence of the ancient Babylonian religion in Roman Catholicism and the ritualism, the Mariism, is that really Semiramis and all that. There are people here that know far more about it than I do. Rob Skiba is very, very much of an expert in this area. Um, but it's very clear that uh, prior to Theosophy, you had Transcendentalism. You had Waldo, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Henry, uh, you know, David Thoreau, and uh, you had all that whole crew there in Concord, Mass. Uh, it's been argued that without transcendentalism, theos the theos theosophical society could never have caught hold. And almost all of the, of the Ger well, not all, but many of the German leaders were, you know, their bedside reading was Madame Blavatsky. You know, and that, she was very influential in their thinking. The secret doctrine, the secret plan, it was Atlantis. The, the root races, the racial hatred that stemmed from the, semi, the demigods that were in Atlantis. And so this, all this stuff is all connected. You know, in some extent, Satan's very smart, but he's not necessarily all that original. Some of the same ideas just keep working again and again and again. So, yes, ma'am, question. Um, Eric Von Braun. Yep. We saw him on the show. Yep. And uh, they asked him how, because he didn't have all, he didn't have a lot of schooling to go to the rocket. They had help. From extraterrestrials. That was inferred. That's what he inferred. Yeah, the question is, where did you get all this great technology, right? And he said, tongue in cheek, we had help. And the inference was that he had help from some type of super agency beyond space time, right? And so some people interpret that as extraterrestrials, and some people interpret that as demonic forces. So, yeah. And I, I do, uh, in the first book, I do a lot of study on the, the history of the occult in Germany and how that influenced America. And again, the argument is that America has had an obsession with the paranormal going back for hundreds of years, going back to the beginning of, uh, of Jamestown and masonry in Jamestown. And it was, fun, you know, it was funded by Francis Bacon, a Rosicrucianist, and so forth. So, yeah. Doug, last, last question or comment, and we'll, well, we'll conclude. The Germans may have been important from America, but what, mm -hmm. what the Germans brought in with their occultism, yes. I, mean, that, I, I think that's far more toxic. Yeah, there was American occultism, and then there was certainly German occultism, and there was the Thule Society and the Vril and all of those things that were really diabolical. Uh, Dietrich Eckhart, the stuff he was practicing, the book The Spear of Destiny talks a bit about that, and uh, Hitler's experimentation with mescaline. Uh, Goodrich Clark denies that. He doesn't believe that most of it's true in one section. Then he says other things in another part of the book that tell you, oh, wait a second. You know, you've just admitted that these guys were occultists, and they were significant occultists, so why do you think that certain others weren't influenced by it? Why do you think Hitler would let, you know, Heinrich Himmler run loose and build up the Ananerbi to 20,000 plus people doing research on folk myths and, you know, Thor and Odin and all these crazy pagan myths? He obviously was supporting it. He could have said no. He didn't want to say no because he believed in it. So, uh, Russ, I should stop, all right? Thanks, you, thank you, everyone.